Okay. Uh, I've been on deputation about a year and a half, year and ten months. Uh, we plan on leaving sometime, Lord willing, in October, November. Uh, that's about all I'm going to say about South Africa. Uh, a few months back, I remember uh, I was up in Wisconsin and my, I gave my wife a call. And I said, well, how was the service down there in Pennsylvania? She said, well, it was real good. Brother, uh, Brother Turner preached. And she goes, he preached a real good sermon, but he was, he was real funny. I go, why was he so funny? And, and she said, well, he was so nervous. He just was really, really nervous and it was real funny watching him. And I remember thinking in my mind, I thought, well, well I, you know, what's to be nervous about? It's not that, that big of a deal. Just get up there and preach. Well, I wish he was here today because I'd like to say I know how he feels right now. I, uh, I'm, I'm kind of tired and, and uh, I had the great blessing of sleeping with my, uh, my, two, my, my wife's out in California and I'm babysitting, which believe me is, uh, is something. Uh, <laughs> I had the blessing of, of sleeping with my two younger daughters last night. And, uh, you know, they were begging me, please, please, I want to sleep with him. And we have this big old king size bed, so I figured it wouldn't be any problem. <laughs> and boy, was I wrong. Uh, I really, right now, I feel like I was in a street fight or something. I got, they beat me and punched me and stabbed me and tried to push me off the bed and everything. I finally, it was like a war. And, you know, like three o'clock in the morning, I, had a def my, I put a defense line of pillows between me and my kids hoping I was going to keep him out, but like a tank, one of them just flipped right over the top of him and came right down on top of me. And somewhere in there, I, I fell asleep or was knocked unconscious or something. I don't know what happened, but it was hard to have a real nice smile for him this morning when I got up, and they're probably real mad at me about that, but uh, anyway, I, uh, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't real sure what I was going to preach today. I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to preach on, uh, if I can say this now, Mephibosheth. And uh, that, is the reason, that is the reason why I'm not going to preach on it, because I cannot pronounce the name. I mean, I can picture myself get going here preaching on it, and every time I have to get to Mephibosheth and have to stop and slow the whole thing down and say Mephibosheth, and I didn't want to do that, so I'm going to, I'm going to preach on something else. Uh, speaking of names, though, my, my wife told me a story, uh, and I, I thought it was pretty good, uh, about an Indian family. And what happened was uh, this young boy came up to his, his uh, father, and he said, he said, Father, where did, uh, where did we get our names from? And his father said, well, son, uh, when your baby sister was born, your mother and I looked out the teepee and uh, we saw a deer uh, running out there in the meadow and we, we named her Running Deer. And, uh, and then your, younger, your baby brother, when he was born, uh, your mother and I looked out the teepee door and there was a bear scrambling up the mountain there and we named him Running Bear. And then when your next brother, uh, Dan, was born, your mother and I looked out the teepee door and there was a, an eagle soaring through the sky and uh, we named him Soaring Eagle. Anyway, why do you ask, puking dog? <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> My wife's got a sense of humor if you don't know that already. Anyway, on that note, uh, would you turn your Bible to the book of Daniel? <clears throat> book of Daniel, chapter 4. Look at Daniel chapter 4 and look at my notes. Uh, you know the, the saying up there in North Carolina, you're, if you got notes, you're not called to preach. I know without my notes, I ain't going to preach, so i gotta, I got to have them here. <laughs> Daniel chapter 4, I'm going to read, uh, kind of jump around here. I'm not going to keep you a long time, I'm just going to kind of go through this thing. Daniel chapter 4, we'll start in, uh, oh, let's see. It's about Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel. We'll start in verse 5 here. It's uh, Nebuchadnezzar talking. I saw a dream which made me afraid, <clears throat> and the thoughts upon my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Uh, therefore made I a decree uh, to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. Uh, then came in the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers, and I told them the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But at last Daniel came before me, whose name is Belshazzar, and he explains that dream, goes on, and I drop down to verse 24, and Daniel gives the interpretation. He says, This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the king, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as an oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to use whoever he will. Then come over to verse, uh, oh, let's see, verse 29. At the end of 12 months, that didn't happen right there, but at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon, and the king spake, and this was his problem right here. And he said, Is not this uh, great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power 
and for the honor of my majesty. And while the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And you want to drop down to verse 33 there. That same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as an oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, until his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird claws. And at the end of the days I, Nebuchadnezzar, I lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, I thank you now, God, for the opportunity to preach here, God, for the open door. I thank you for Dr. Ruckman, God, and the, and the man of God that he is. I pray, God, now that you'll use me. Uh, Lord, there's a lot of people out here, a lot of needy people. And God, I pray that I'll be a minister as I should. Uh, Lord, that I'll be a blessing and a help to him in some way. God, I pray that you'd open their hearts and minds now to receive thy word. Uh, God, I realize uh, uh, beyond a shadow of a doubt that I'll fail you uh, without you, God, and I need you right now. I need your help, uh, Lord, to speak uh, the word you'd have me to speak. I pray that you set me aside and use me today for your glory. And I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 The story is a familiar one here. It's Daniel Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, the problem really with, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar is this. Uh, he gets to looking at himself. Uh, he gets to looking at the ability he has and the, and the talents that he has and the wealth that he has. And he gets what a lot of people call the big head. Uh, he gets kind of puffed up and thinks he's something. And what happens is God says, okay, Nebuchadnezzar, you think you're something, I'm going to show you you're nothing. As a matter of fact, you're going to go out there and eat grass like an oxen and be wet with the dew of heaven until you, you realize that you are nothing without me. And would to God this morning, my friends, that some Christians, maybe some in this room right here, uh, would have to go out and eat grass like an oxen and be wet with the dew of heaven until they came to the acknowledgement and the realization that you are nothing outside of Jesus Christ. Uh, until you come to the realization, my friend, that whatever time you might have, whatever ability you might have, whatever wealth you might have, whatever understanding of the scriptures you might have, whatever nice family you might have, whatever you might have, it's only because God gave it to you and for no other reason than that. Uh, my friends, I, I like to tell you tonight, uh, this morning, that you're not your own. You've been bought with a price and that price was the highest price that could ever be paid. It was price, it was paid with God's blood, the blood of Jesus Christ that can wash away all our sin. Now that's a good example of a dream that comes true and there's a few of them in the Bible. In fact, there's a lot of them in the Bible. You've got uh, uh, Joseph and the baker and the butler and, uh, and, and uh, many, many others. One that kind of intrigued me all the time was uh, the dream that Pilate's wife had. I, w I often wonder what she dreamed that day. Uh, she, she, said, uh, uh, she came to her husband and said, I have nothing to do with this just man, for I suffered many things about him in a dream this day. And I, I wonder what she saw in that dream. I mean, I wonder if she saw some of the things in the book of Revelation. I, I wonder if she came up to, I wonder if she came up to Pilate and said, uh, listen, Hub, uh, you know, let's leave this guy alone right here. Uh, the, this man that looks so ragged and beat up right now, one day is coming back as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Maybe we ought to just kind of leave him alone. And I wonder if sometimes that's the reason why Pilate, you know, some, sometimes your wife has good advice. I mean, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes they do. And I'm sure Pilate was no different than any of us, and he probably, he, he probably thought about what his wife told him. Maybe that's one of the reasons why he kind of just decided to wash his hand of the whole thing. I don't know that for sure. But anyway, that's a dream. I'll tell you this, though. I, I, me and Pilate got one thing in common. We got one thing in common, and only one thing. And that's that I find no fault in Jesus Christ. I find, I find no fault in his redemption. I find no fault in his justification. I find no fault in his sanctification. I find no fault in the promises of God. I find no fault in that peace that passes all understanding. I find no fault in his friendship that never, la that never ends. I find no fault in his comfort and his satisfaction. I find no fault in Jesus Christ. I find no fault in him. I guess... Uh, I guess all of us, in one way or another, are dreamers. I'm sure you all have your dreams, just like I had mine. I, I've got a few favorite ones. Uh, when I was coming up as a kid, uh, my favorite dream was, uh, and I, every time I say this, most people don't know what I'm talking about, so it makes me feel real old. Uh, you know, I'm not even 40 years, or almost 40 years old, and, and really that's not that old. Uh, of course, if you go by that bumper sticker says, uh, uh, 40 isn't old if you're a tree. And uh, I, Anyway, I, when I was coming up, I... Uh, my dream was to, uh, to be like Martin Milner on Route 66. Now, I don't know how many of you guys, how, you know, I don't know if you know or remember that or not. We've got some older people here. And he had, he had a partner. Uh, I can't remember his name. I think his first name was Bud, though. And uh, that's, one of the few, that's one of the few shows I would sit and watch if I had a TV, because I, I, I really loved uh, Route 66. And what that thing was, uh, they had a Corvette, and what they did is they drove up and down Route 66. Uh, and that was kind of like their life. And it was always a white Corvette. 
I used to watch this thing. I thought, man, if, they, if anything is life, that's it. Uh, you know, driving up and down the interstates, uh, Route 66, and just, uh, you know, working in garages and, and kitchens and all that kind of stuff and fighting and, and all that kind of thing. And, and uh, I, you know, I thought that was, I, that was it. If anything was life, it was driving around a Corvette on Route 66. And uh, now believe me, after driving them down the interstate for the last two years, that is not life. Uh, <clears throat> I'm glad that one didn't come true. Uh, but that was my dream. I, of course, I, I've always had the dream of, uh, in the last few years, I, 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 you probably ain't going to like this, but I'm going to tell it anyway. It's uh, the dream of uh, being in a B-52 bomber and uh, being in the bombardier as we fly over T uh, Tehran there in Iran and <laughs> dropping, a, dropping a bomb right on the, the, uh, the home of the Ayatollah Khomeini there. Now, somebody's beat me to that. God did. He killed them anyway, but uh, I'm glad he's gone. I, I just wish it would have happened sooner. You say, well, what a thing for a Christian to say. Well, that man killed mi uh, millions of people. He hated our guts, and he would have killed you. if you. I rejoice over it. I say, praise God, he's dead. I didn't like him. I still don't like him. I don't like the other Ayatollahs over there. I wish th what we ought to do is just go bomb the place, make a, make a uh, you know, get some bulldozer and clear it out, make a parking lot, build a Kmart, Walmart, and... You know, Shoney's to eat in uh, and uh, some stuff and get over and put a fence around it and show them how Americans live. <laughs> but uh, that, that was, that's another dream. Unfortunately, like I said, that one hadn't come true either. But like I said, we're all dreamers in one way or another. I, and I'm sure you got your dreams. Uh, you know, we you know, want to be a fireman or a soldier. And, uh, you know, Brother Strauss over there, he's always wanted to be a soldier. He, he's a real military type guy. And uh, he's hoping that dream is going to come true, I guess, someday. And, uh, you know, be a, an astronaut and all these kind of things. Of course, I don't know whether I'd want to be an astronaut anymore if that thing blew up out there. But firemen and movie star and all that kind of stuff and uh, you know I'm not one of these guys that that badmouth the United States uh, I'm, I'm a real American I'm, you know red white and blue I say if you don't like it get out I'll, 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 I'll give you a kick to help you get out but uh, I'm you know I'm American and I and and uh, I know our, I know our country is has got some wickedness in it I know what sin sick as can be I know it's turned his back on God I know all that kind of stuff but you know what there ain't no country in the face of the earth that's like America not one. You can't find it. If you can find it, you gotta go move over there. But uh, I love America, and it, it is the land. It still is the land of opportunities. Maybe not the way it used to be, uh, but it still is the land of opportunities. It's a land where dreams can still come true, and I'm sure many have come true for you. They have for me. And uh, I, you know, it's a place where you can still become president. I mean, you can get a, some old, some old ignorant farm boy or some uh, high-class guy, and they, if they work hard and. Uh, uh, you know, eventually maybe they can be president. We've had some good examples of some real dumb people being president lately. <laughs> Jimmy Carter is a great example of that. But nonetheless, it's still it's still a, a, an opportunity. The opportunities are still there. And uh, I'm not I'm not going to preach this morning on dreams that come true, though. That's not my sermon. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to preach on some dreams that won't come true. As a matter of fact, I'm going to preach uh, uh, whether you're whether you're uh, rich here today or whether you're educated here today or whether you're not educated, whether you're black or white, whether you're a man or woman, uh, whether you're young or old, whether you live in Pensacola or South Africa or Europe or anywhere else, these are some dreams that will never come true. Some dreams that will never come true. And I'd say, first of all, a dream that will never come true is the dream that you can sin without consequence. That you can sin without consequence. You know, I've been saved a long time and the thing that amazes me nowadays is how lightly how lightly we so-called Bible-believing Christians, how lightly we take sin. Amen. It's like, uh, you know, the old saying, familiarity uh, uh, breeds contempt. Unfortunately, that's not the case when it comes to sin. Uh, we don't hold sin in contempt. Uh, we got this idea nowadays that somehow because we live in the 20th century and it's in the, up almost in the 1990s, that God has uh, he's somehow come, uh, become more progressive. Uh, he's, as a matter of fact, he's become liberal. He's joined the uh, Democratic Party. Uh, he's moved his throne to Massachusetts. And, you know, he's, uh, he, his, his stand on sin just isn't what he used to be. And you get to talking about sin and people say, oh, come on, you're old-fashioned, man. That's back in the 1800s. That's back in the 1700s. Sin is what you make it. I mean, see, it's all in your head. Uh, some things are good and some are bad, but you know, you can make the judgment yourself. You don't have to get into all this kind of, this, this kind. You need to be more open-minded about the thing, more progressive. I mean, you got, you're too conservative, you're too right-wing, you're too, uh, you know, you're too reactionary. Uh, come on, you know, open your mind a little bit. Be a little bit open-minded. You know what the problem is this morning, my friends? Uh, Christians and lost people alike, they become so open-minded that their brains have fallen out. The wages of sin is still death. Be sure your sin will find you out. God has not changed his stand on sin. We Bible believers say, you know, well, we believe what God says, but sometimes we, we kind of uh, qualify that by saying, well, he really didn't mean that. He really didn't mean that. And that holds true when it comes to sin. It holds true when it comes to sin. 
We, uh, we uh, think that, you know, we can, because we were under grace, that we can go out and just kind of piddle with it and play with it and mess around with it. And because God hasn't uh, knocked us down with a bolt of lightning or blinded us or cut off our hands or arms or taken one of our family members or taken everything we got, uh, it seems like God doesn't care that we're sinning. So we just continue in it. And you know that's true. So what you got is a bunch of people uh, uh, with the excuse, and you've all heard it, maybe you've used it, I used it even myself, is that, you know, we have our besetting sin. Our besetting sin. And what, what we're saying is that's a sin, we just don't want to get any, uh, any victory over it. As a matter of fact, what we're saying is we're enjoying it. We like it. And the excuse is, it's my besetting sin. Brother, will you pray for me? I got a besetting sin. Fine, are you trying to get any victory over it? Have you even tried to stop it? And you wonder why, why Christians nowadays are down and out and defeated and doing nothing for God. Amen. They're out there smoking the cigarettes and drinking the beer and reading the pornography and running around on people's wives and doing all the junk that everybody else does. And they say, God ain't using me no more. Can you, can you imagine why not with all that going on? They say, well, I don't believe that. You're dreaming a dream that will never come true. You cannot sin without consequence. It found out Cain. It found out Moses. It found out David. It found out Samson. It found out Solomon. It found out Jesus. It'll find out you. It'll find out you. You know, I had uh, when I was kind of was in the, I was in the in the drug scene real heavy, and we were selling selling a lot of drugs, making a lot of money and stuff. And I always had the attitude we were getting something over. You know, uh, we we had everything down. It was like a, uh, we knew where the cops were going to be. We knew what they looked like. They couldn't fool us with their unmarked cars or their little dress. They, they tried to dress like us. They couldn't fool. We had we had the thing down. We thought there's no way they're ever going to get us. Uh, you know, I thought there's no way I'd ever get caught. I'm too smart. I'm too streetwise. I I, did, I can get away with. It. I'll continue to get. It. I'll make a lot of money. I I'll, I'll just keep going and keep going. Pretty soon I'll be a millionaire. They ain't going to get me. They ain't going to get me. I'm getting away with it. I ain't, I ain't in the penitentiary. I ain't in jail. I don't need no bail bondsman. I'm getting away with it. Kind of like Christians think about sin. I'm getting away with it. God ain't killed me. And I did get away with it for about three and a half years or four years. And I was sitting there with my big old puffed up head thinking that I had got, uh, you know, broke, got, broken the law and gotten away with it. And one morning, about three o'clock in the morning, I saw the door fly off my, my bedroom and there was a, a group they call the Metro Squad in Los Angeles, an anti-drug uh, um, group, an elite uh, bunch of policemen. And they put a shotgun in my face and all of a sudden uh, uh, my attitude about not getting caught changed real quick. I mean, a 12-gauge shotgun will make you think that real quick. And I found myself in jail and then prison. I spent two and two, over two and a half years there. And uh, I realized something. Your sin will find you out. Amen. Young people, you start messing around, you know, um, playing here and playing there. And you think because God hasn't done anything to you that he's not going to. He will eventually. Now, I, now don't get me wrong. I ain't saying you can lose your salvation. You ain't going to lose your salvation Amen. if you're saved here. Listen, there ain't nothing in this world or nothing outside this world that can ever take your salvation from you Amen. except God, and thank God He said He never would. Amen. But you can be chastised. And you can be beat up and pushed around and go through a lot of suffering. Maybe some of you are going through that right now. You're not happy. You're not, you're not, you don't have the joy of salvation. You don't have any peace in your life. And you can't understand why. But you got all the excuses. And you know, I've heard them all. Well, you know, there's nothing wrong. There's, there's just nothing wrong with drinking a little beer once in a while. There ain't nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's got hops and protein and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. And uh, you know, I mean, you know, Coke. I, you don't want to, Coke's bad for you. You know how that thing. You pour it on the car, you used to paint right off. That's not so with beer. I mean, you can you can drink beer. It's good health food, man. Health food. And, I mean, you know, you heard the excuses. You know, ma marijuana. What's smoking a little smoking a little dope once in a while? What's it gonna hurt? Nobody knows. You know, laugh, listen to music, have a good time. God. It's a dispensation of grace. Let's enjoy ourselves, live it up a little. You know, my Christian life's kind of leveled out. It's kind of a, it's kind of grown stagnant. You need to, need to have some fun here. I mean, who, who cares? Nobody, you know, like uh, like Doctor said, everybody else is doing it. You know, it's I'm, I'm not addicted. I'm not I'm not snorting cocaine or anything. I, just a little, just a little, you know, a little dope. It's not, not going to hurt anything. Not going to hurt anything. Keep on. Go ahead and drink the beer. Go ahead and smoke the dope and see where you're at in maybe five or ten years. See what you're doing for God in maybe five and ten years. See where your family's at and your job and your finances, your mental health and your physical health. See what happens in five or ten years. Go on. 
Keep messing around. Keep playing with sin. Keep dabbling and messing around and thinking God's not going to do anything to you. He is, my friend. Amen. And if you don't believe it, you're dreaming a dream that'll never come true. Amen. It's a dream that'll never come true. A dream that'll never come true is you can sin without consequence. Another dream that'll never come true is the dream that you can serve. That you can serve without sacrifice. That you can serve without sacrifice. Now, I've been on deputation. I've run into, I don't know how many people that, I, you know, come up and ask me, well, you know, how'd you get called? And how, how'd you get, how'd this thing come about that you're going to the mission field? And, uh, you know, I try to tell them and stuff. And, and what, what I, I've heard a lot of is they'll say, well, you know, I, I love God. I want to do something for God. And I, I, I really do. I, I want to serve Him. I want to be a good soldier. And I say, well, fine. I, do you feel like you're called to preach? Yeah, I'm called to preach. And I go, what do you, what do you, what have you been doing? I mean, are you going to the old folks' home preaching? Well, no, I, I you know, I don't, I don't want to go to the old folks. It's kind of, kind of smelly there, and it's kind of, you know, people don't shout and they don't say amen, and sometimes they don't even look at me, and I don't think they're hearing half the time. And I, yeah. God's calling to preach, but not, not the old folks' home. I, I don't want to go to the old folks' home. Well, okay, well, you got a jail here in town, don't you? Yeah, we have a jail. Well, you, you go to the jail, don't you? Well. No, I, I don't. I don't go to the jail. It's uh, you know, there's queers there. Got AIDS and stuff. They might touch me or something. I, I you know, it's uh, child molesters and rapists and murder. You know, kind of the low class people, the, the the people down there. You know, you, oh, you mean the people that Jesus Christ died for? Amen. Yeah, those kind of people. They're they're over there. I I don't you know I don't I don't want to I don't I don't really want to go to the jail. You call the yeah I'm called to preach. I'm called to preach. Well, there's plenty of stop signs and corners. I see a lot of people out there by the malls and shopping centers. And uh, you must, you must, you preach in the street, don't you? Well, no, I, I don't preach in the street either. That's kind of a, you kind of look foolish standing out there. I, you know, I work here in town. There's people are going to see me. I, I, I mean, uh, you know, so I'm going to get hit by a beer can or something. I, you know, injury, uh, hurt, pain, and stuff to me. I, I, you know what you're saying? You're telling me that you want to do something for God, but you're not willing to sacrifice anything to do it. Amen. Listen, there's old, folk, there's old folks in those old folks homes that are on their way to hell, whether they can hear you or not. Whether they smell or not, when no matter what the problem is, they're on their way to hell, just like some of you in this room tonight, th this morning. They need to hear the Word of God. Amen. There's people in that jail, they're looking for something. Yeah, they're down and out. Yeah, they're probably filthy. Maybe some of them are queer, but God can save queers. He can save drug, drug addicts and drunks. He saved me. Amen. They need to hear it. But you're not willing to sacrifice. You're not willing to sacrifice. Some of you won't, you won't give a dime uh, to, to help out somebody. And I, I'm, I'm not saying it because I'm a missionary. I, I don't care about the money. But you won't. You know, you talk about, oh, we, 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 you know, we need souls saved. We need to get the word out. But when it comes to, to giving a, a few bucks to get a man over there to go do it, you don't want to give a dime for it. You won't tithe to the church. You won't support the church financially. Oh, you know, uh, Jimmy, T Jimmy and Tammy Baker and all that kind of stuff. I, uh, I just don't think, you know, finances. I, well, God, you know, God is, they ought to live by faith. I don't, they don't need me to give, give money. No sacrifice. No sacrifice. I love God. I want to serve God. I want to do something for God. But you won't sacrifice. You won't sacrifice. Every great man in the, in the, in the Bible that did something for God sacrificed something. And if you're going to do something for God, I'm talking about, I'm talking serious, folks. I'm talking about doing something for God. Not just sitting in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and going back out there and forgetting everything. Amen. There's people dropping off in the hell by the multitudes. Amen, They're dying by the thousands day in and day out and we sit here and don't do anything. Amen. 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 I love God. I'm called to preach. I'm called to do this. But you won't get up and do anything about it. You're not willing to sacrifice. You say, preacher, I think God will use me anyway. You're dreaming a dream that will never come true. I heard, a, you know, I heard a story one time. I read a book, as a matter of fact, a, a book that a Brother Hollett gave me. And uh, I, I like it. I, in fact, I'm reading it again. I'm going to read it again. It's a missionary book. <coughs> and the thing spoke to my heart. And uh, it's called To Perish for Their Saving. And... Uh, there's some good things in there. I want to tell you about one of them. There's a, talking about sacrifice here. There's two men. <clears throat> one of them is Stan Dale in Australia, and the other one was a, a Phil Masters, an American. And they were called to, to the country of New Guinea. And uh, there, it's a mountainous area, and a lot of valleys. And most of the natives live down in those valleys. 
And uh, the, the two of them got up there and they looked down on top of those mountains, looked down in the valleys and saw, you know, multitudes and multitudes of, of cannibals, literally cannibals and headhunters, uh, on their way to hell, all caught up in witchcraft and heathenism. And uh, Phil Masters of the American wrote this when he saw that, as he looked on from one valley to the next and uh, through the horizon in New Guinea. He wrote this, he said, Then with a rush, the intolerable craving shivered through me like a trumpet call. Oh, to save these, to perish for their saving, die for their life, be offered for them all. Well, you know what happened with them? They got down in those valleys, and they got some churches started, and they got some people saved. And like most missionaries, they kept moving on and moving on and moving on. And finally, they got to a tribe that didn't want them around. And Phil Masters was ambushed, was shot with over 100 arrows, was taken into the camp, and eaten. Preacher, I, I, I'm just too shy. I can't hand out a track. I can't stand on the street because it makes me look like a fool. I just can't do those. I just don't have the ability. Oh, to save these, to perish for their saving. There's a man that gave up his family, that gave up his country, that gave up his very life for the souls of men and women. And you can't hand out a track? You can't open your mouth for Jesus Christ on the street corner. You can't go to the old folks' homes or the jails and try to get some people saved when there's no danger to you at all. Amen. You're not willing to sacrifice Amen, brother. if you're honest with yourself. I think God will use me anyway. You're dreaming a dream that'll never come true. It'll never come true. Another dream that'll never come true is a dream that you can spiritually grow without the Word of God in prayer. Yeah. And believe me, that's a dream. That's a dream. You got people probably sitting here right now that spend more time reading the TV guide than you do your Bible. Amen. You got people sitting here right now that spend more time reading the Sunday paper, which is mostly 90% advertisements, than you do reading that book. And you know it. You know it. You're sitting here looking at me and you know it. You read, you read one verse a week and you say, that's, that's all I need. I'll grow that way. You'll not grow an inch. You'll be a spiritual midget, a spiritual uh, a pygmy for the rest of your life. I saved 19 years and most of my time I was backslidden as can be. And the reason being I put the word of God down. I quit praying. I didn't do what I should do. And I was just a nothing for eight or nine years of my Christian life. Now some of you, as I said before, you're, you're here and, you, and you're not happy. You're not, you don't have the joy of salvation. Uh, uh, God ain't doing nothing with you. And the reason being is you're not reading this book. You're not feeding yourself. This is your food right here. Without it, you're going to starve to death. You've got to read the thing. You've got to read it. You've got to have some sort of plan where you read it every day. You're not praying. I mean, nowadays, you've got Christians this day and age that they're so lazy they can't even make up their own prayer. They get it on a calendar or a devotional book and they read the thing. And that's, you know, that's their prayer. I was at a church out, uh, in, I think it was in Ohio, we sat down, you know, had a meeting with him, sat down and had dinner, his whole family sitting there, and the, and the pastor uh, said, well, let's, let's say grace. And uh, we all bowed our head, and he, there was no, no, there, nobody saying anything for a minute, so I kind of opened my eyes to see what was going on. And sure enough, he, went, he reached over in his telephone, little telephone table, right by the table, and pulled out what looked like a devotional book, and read a prayer that had nothing to do with the food at all. And I thought, man, oh man, this guy can't just, he just can't bow his head and say, thank you, God, for the food. Amen. I mean, that's how bad we've gotten. No prayer. You know what? You don't pray and you're not going to have any power. Amen. You need prayer to get power from God. You know, you know, to know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His suffering. I want to know God. Amen. My happiness comes from getting closer and closer to Him. And it should for you too. And the only way you're going to get to know Him is like if I want to, I want to know... down here I'd have to talk to him all the time he'd have to talk with me all the time we get to know our, our quirks and our weirdnesses and, our, and, our, and the things that go on in our lives we get to know each other but it takes talking with each other Amen. if you don't talk to God you ain't going to know him it's as simple as that if you don't know him you're not going to have any power and most of you today probably don't have any power to do anything for God we live to see Christians sit around in the church and man I've seen them in the last two years we got the book uh, we got the Bible-believing preacher sitting up there preaching at them, and we're just good for nothing. 
You say, you're a missionary. Why don't you start preaching on South Africa? The truth of the matter is, my friend, most people don't even care about their next door neighbor, let alone somebody in a foreign land. I'm not going to tickle your ears this morning as you already gathered, I'm sure. You need the Word of God and you need prayer. I, you know, you always hear about Christians having burdens and I'll admit I didn't have a burden for a long time for anything. And uh, until uh, I think it was, uh, it was either Dr. or Brother McGee, I don't know which one it was, but, uh, preached a message on prayer and I got real convicted about that thing. And he was, it was a thing he used. He said, you should be ashamed of yourself if you don't have a prayer list. And I got ashamed of myself. I didn't have a prayer list. You know, you say, people come and say, pray for me, brother. And you say, yeah, I will, I will. But you don't, know, you don't remember the name. You don't remember the request or anything. 15 minutes later or two minutes, in my case, you forget the whole thing. So I got a prayer list together. You know what? You, start, you, you write that name down and you start praying for that person every day, you'll get a burden for somebody. You'll get a burden for somebody. You start getting concerned for souls. Hell will start getting real to you. I mean, you, you every morning you're crying out and saying, God, will you save this person? He's on his way to hell. Please save him. You'll get a burden. You'll get a burden. But ain't nobody doing it. We say we're going to pray, but we don't. We have prayer rooms up here. and there's, Most of the time, there's hardly anybody up there. We've got two, three hundred, four hundred people in this church. You think maybe you get, uh, especially the men, you think you, maybe you get 60, 70, maybe 100 people up there praying before service. You don't. Go up there on a Sunday and see how many is up there. 10, 15, if you're lucky. Most of the time, not even that many. And you wonder why sometimes the church has trouble here. Nobody praying. Nobody praying. You say, well, I, you know, I, I have my little devotional. Now I lay me down to sleep. and I, I, you know, I'm sure God honors that kind of stuff, and, and I, I'm sure I'll be right. You're dreaming. I'm sure God will use me. You're dreaming. I don't really need to read the book that much. I don't want to be a fanatic. You're dreaming a dream. That'll never come true. It's a dream that'll never come true. You need to grow. And the only way you're going to grow is reading this Bible and praying. Crying out to God. Crying out to God. I'm not talking about no, 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 uh, uh, you know, written political speech when you, when you pray. I'm talking praying to God as you are. As a low-down, rotten sinner. Yeah. Just like me. Amen. Ask Him to do something with you. Ask Him to forgive you. Ask Him to put you out there and, and, and preach and tell people about Jesus Christ. To give the power that you need to face a hostile world. That world hates our guts. Amen. It has no use for us whatsoever. And for you to stand out there and be bold and have the zeal that you should have uh, to preach the gospel, whether it be knocking on doors or on the street corner or whatever it is, you're going to need some power, my friends. And that power comes through prayer. And if you don't pray, the simple fact of the matter is you ain't going to have no power. You're not going to have any power. Some dreams that will never come true that you can sin without consequence. That you can serve without sacrifice. That you can grow without the Word of God in prayer. And finally, that there's salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I don't know who's lost here today and who isn't. I figure most of you are saved. But I'll tell you this. You ain't never going to get to heaven without Jesus Christ. There ain't no other way. Uh, you can search all your life and try to find it in Buddha or, or Hindus or whatever the other religions might be, but you ain't going to get there without Jesus Christ. Amen. I mean, you can, you can uh, uh, cut your hair short and put a tie on and put a suit on and, and uh, uh, live right and do right and all that kind of stuff, but it won't get you into heaven. Amen. Now, I'm not going to tell you that you need, to, uh, that you need to, to stop drinking and stop smoking and stop cussing and stop listening to rock music and cut your hair short. I'm not going to tell you that kind of stuff. I'm not going to tell you any of that. That's not Christianity for one thing. I'll tell you what Christianity is. Christianity is a belief in a person and what that person did for you and I. Amen. The person being Jesus Christ that he died, was buried, and rose again the third day. That is the gospel. Now, some of you in this room this morning, uh, God has been chasing you all your life. You know it. You know it as sure as you're sitting there. He's been on your back all your life. He has put roadblocks in front of you, uh, bumper stickers, preachers, Christian friends, your family, whatever it might be, uh, marquees and the church things. Uh, he's simply saying, stop! Stop, sinners! Stop while you still can! I want to save you! I want to have mercy upon you! I want to wash you in my blood! Stop! Not me. I'm young. I want to enjoy myself. I want to party for a while. You know, I want to run around and have a good time. Maybe somewhere when I'm 40, 50, 60 years old. Maybe then. Stop! Stop while you still can. 
He's not willing any should perish, but that all should become repentance. He can save you this morning. He can save you this morning. Amen. You say, well, I, I've heard this over and over again. I know you have. I know you have. But if you're, if you're truthful with yourself, you know you're not happy. You know you're not. If you look yourself in the mirror, you know you're not happy. You're a lost person here today. You know you're not. You don't have any peace. You don't have any joy. You've had, you've had the parties. You've had the drugs. You've had the money. You've had the beer. You've had all that stuff. And you're not happy. You know you ain't happy. And you keep thinking it's going to change. It ain't going to change. Amen. It's just going to get worse the older you get. Amen. You're missing something. You're missing something. you got a hole in your heart. And the only thing that's ever going to fill it is Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing else. Nothing else. You don't know me from anything, and I, you know you can say, "Well, you're, I don't know who, that, who this guy is, and he's lying." I know that Jesus Christ is real. Amen. I know that He can save your soul. Yeah. I know He can give you a peace that passes all understanding. I know He can change your life. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. The yeah. Bible says. What's the world ever done for you? What's it ever done for you? Giving you heartaches and burdens, Amen. put you in despair. Amen. What's the devil ever done for you? Give you a little sin for a season. A little satisfaction for a few days? Then you have to run out and try to get it again? Is that what you want out of life? That is not life. Amen. You, know what you, you know what you're doing? You're existing. You're just existing. The Bible says, He who has the Son has life. He who has the Son. That Son is Jesus Christ. Amen. You say, well, I'll make it some way. I, you know, I'm a good person. I, uh, I'm a patriotic American. I, you know... I've, uh, I brought my family up well. I'm very moral. I, I have good, well-kept children. I, I have, I've been in my job for 10 or 15 years. I, you know, I got a, a vote for Ollie North on my bumper and, and uh, save the whales and the seals and the woodchucks and all that stuff. And, and uh, I'm sure when I get up there to the pearly gates, God's going to say, well done, you come on in. You're dreaming. You're dreaming. Well, I, I, th I believe, preacher, that God's a loving God and He would never, never hurt anybody. I know, I, you know, the Bible says that God is love. And I just know that because uh, I haven't killed anybody and haven't, uh, haven't uh, raped anybody and haven't committed armed robbery, that God will certainly take me in. I know when I get up to those gates, old St. Peter's going to slap me on the back and say, Come on in. You're dreaming. Amen. You're dreaming. Amen. Well, I just don't believe there is a God. And, I, you know, education is the way. Uh, this world needs to be educated. And once we get this world educated, peace will, be come, will come upon earth. And I, if there is a God, I'll be able to stand before Him and justify my actions. Boy, are you dreaming. Amen. You are dreaming. Amen. Hell's a real place. Yeah. And you're going there without Jesus Christ. Amen. And you don't have to. Listen, salvation is a free gift. Amen. Free. Just what the Word says, free. All you got to do is take it. I love what Dr. Ruckman says. I use it all the time. He says, Jesus Christ will take you if you'll take Him. You can't get any simpler than that. He will take you if you'll take Him. You say, well, I'm just too wicked. He says, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't think God will take me. He said, I, 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 I know why I cast you out if you come to Him. God will take you. He'll take you with all your sin, whatever it is. If you come to Him. If you come to Him. You're not here by coincidence this morning. You're not here by coincidence. You might only have a few days left. You might only have a few hours left. How many more heartbeats do you think you have? How many breaths of air do you think you're going to take before God comes and takes you? Well, I'm young. That doesn't mean anything. The Bible says it's appointed unto men once to die. you got an appointed time. It might be when you're 18 or 19 years old. You don't know what it is. The Bible says prepare to meet thy God. Are you ready to meet him? What's going to be your excuse? What are you going to tell him when you get up there? How are you going to justify your sin? You're going to get up there and say, Well, you know, I, uh, God, I, I, I rejected your, your son Jesus Christ because of Tim and Tammy Baker. Because, you know, because Jimmy Swaggart ran around with some woman, is that going to be your excuse for your sin? That's not going to get it. Well, I, I, didn't, I, I rejected Jesus Christ because there's hypocrites in the church. Well, you got that right. There is hypocrites in the church. 
But it ain't going to justify your sin. Amen. What excuse do you have? The fact of the matter is you don't have any excuse. You never will have an excuse. You say, well, I, I didn't sin yesterday. What about the sin before that? I ain't going to sin today. What about tomorrow? You're a sinner. And the wages of sin is still death, as I said before. Now, the price has been paid. The whole thing has been paid. Someone took your place on the cross. Someone suffered for you and I. That person is Jesus Christ. Now, you can be saved by accepting him. It's as simple as that. You say, well, I'll make it. I'll make it. You're dreaming a dream that will never come true. More than that, my friends, one day that dream will become a nightmare. It will become a nightmare. Once you're in, your, you're in hell, you're never going to get out. Amen. Young people, your friends can get you in there, but they ain't never going to get you out. Amen. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Some dreams that will never come true, that you can sin without consequence, that you can serve without sacrifice, that you can grow without the Word of God in prayer, that you can have salvation outside of Jesus Christ. My friend, those are dreams that will never come true. Now, I don't know what your situation is here this morning. I don't know what your needs are, but I would guess there's some backslidden Christians in here. You ain't doing right and you ain't living right, and you know it as sure as you're sitting there. Ain't it about time you got serious with God? Have it about time you face the facts of the way you're living and what you're doing? As I said, it's a serious thing. You've got the truth. You've got a responsibility because you have the truth. Why don't you get down here this morning as yourself, speak to him in your own words and ask him to forgive you and make you what you should be? Why don't you just quit playing games and get serious for God? Lost person, let me ask you a question. If you were to die this morning, do you know where you'd go? Forget about what's going on in the world. Forget about your finance. Forget about what problems you might have, your girlfriend or your boyfriend, whatever it might be. Forget about it all, just for a minute. This is the most serious question you're going to have to answer in your life. Do you know where you're going to go when you die? If you don't know, if you don't know, don't you think it's about time you found out? There's men in this church right now. You have Brother, Brother Douglas, Brother Smith over here, and a lot, of, a lot of these other brothers and sisters. We're glad to show you how to have your sins forgiven. So you can leave here this morning knowing where you're going to go when you die. Reconcile to God. Your sins forgiven. Wash in His blood. A home in heaven. Don't you want that? You can have it now. It's a free gift. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's for you. He died for you. He came not for the righteous, but for sinners like you and I. Won't you come? Won't you come? Wait a few minutes. I know the devil is speaking to you right now. He's saying, don't listen to that preacher. He's one of them fanatics. He's one of them Bible thumpers. What he's got ain't real. I don't care what the devil says. I'm telling you what I got is real. It can be real for you too. He wants to damn your soul to hell. He wants to destroy your life and he's probably doing a good job of it right now. Don't listen to him. You say, preacher, I just don't have enough, I'm just too nervous, I just don't have enough guts to come forward. I'd be glad to come to you. Just raise your hand. Let me ask you this question. How many know if you were to die right now, you'd go to heaven? Raise your hand. Okay, you can put him down. Now some of you couldn't raise him. That means you're not saved. You're not saved. Let me ask you this. Would you raise your hand and I'll just pray for you. You say, Preacher, I, I want to be saved. I don't understand it real well and I'm kind of scared of, of the thing, but would you pray for me? Would you raise your hand? Anybody like that in here? Anybody? Time's running out, friend. It's running out. Prepare to meet thy God, the Bible says. I'll pray for you. I won't come to you. I won't ask you to come forward. I won't do anything. I'll just pray for you. Anybody? See, I'm not saved. I'd like to be saved. Will you ra raise your hand? Anybody? God wants to save you. You're not here by coincidence. All right.
to have you stand, but I want to keep have you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you would. Just stand this morning. Brother Cotton, I want you to sing a couple of verses of that invitation this morning. Somebody lost here this morning, and that invitation's for you. Go ahead, Brother Cotton. Come on this morning, what you waiting on? You waiting till you die and go to hell? Is that what you waiting on this morning? You hear him talking about love this morning? God is love, yes he is. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that God loves us and gave his son a propitiation for our sin. What are you gonna do with God's son? God loved you, L-O-V-E-D, past tense. He put it in Calvary. You want to come get it this morning? Better not listen to all the world. All the different religions are telling you about how much God loves you. You're wrong. It's past tense, friend. He manifested his love for you at Calvary. Will you accept his son this morning? So what will happen?